is where I can get decent internet connection. Oh. At home, at home uh, tulog lang um, kasi walang internet eh. Anyway, okay. let's get started. Good. Uh, we're going to be live uh, in in few seconds. So uh, okay. after that, lahat na ng lahat na sasabihin niyo nasa YouTube na. Okay, okay, we're going live. Um 30 seconds and then um 30 seconds. Uh, pwedeng i-introduce ni Maya ang si Romel. Top of the office. Oh, yeah. the Thank group. you so much. <clears throat> Jomer. Oh, at home ka, tulog na um, kasi walang internet eh. Okay. Uh, gosh. Oh yeah. Romel, I think it is better if you put it in full uh, view. At all. I, I, I full screen. I full screen na nako. Okay. Oh, so, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Yes. Um, nice. Just minimize some stuff there. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we are live in YouTube. Nice. Uh, so, okay, so we're going to start. This is another uh, webinar uh, by the One UP Applied Mathematics Group. So, uh, let's have Mayang to introduce Romel, our speaker. All right. So, uh, good morning, everyone. And from Ayong Buntag, magandang umaga sa lahat. So, our speaker for today is uh, a graduate of uh, Bachelor's of Science in Applied Mathematics in UP Mindanao. He did his Master's of Science in Mathematics in uh, UP Diliman. And uh, now, he's a PhD candidate uh, in the Australian National University. Uh, I think I already uh, mentioned last time Now winner, naging winner of winner siya. I think that was 2018, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm really excited to introduce to you uh, our speaker for today. And he will be talking about solving inverse problems using regularization. I think that's part of his PhD work. So uh, our speaker is Mr. Romel Rial. Romel? Hello. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to talk about my uh, research and I hope you're all doing well wherever you are listening from uh, right now and I, I just a little I just uh, I just just a little housekeeping on my part because there are some like construction going on just right outside my house so in case you hear some construction noise I apologize for that uh, I have no control on it but anyway so what am I going to talk is um, some part of some something about the research that I was doing, or actually I'm currently doing while um, doing my PhD in the Australian National, National University. And I'm, I'm doing this research with my supervisor, Chin Yanjin, and um, some host of uh, other collaborators worldwide. So just a little, re uh, just a little overview of what um, I am going to talk about. So uh, just, try to motivate everyone with some important examples of inverse problems. And we will go deeper on the mathematical uh, formulation on this one. And then we'll focus on, on the two classes of regularization methods that I focused while in PhD. The first one is uh, the token of regularization. And more in, in particular, I uh, was I focused on a more generalized uh, ver version of this uh, technique with an important um, scheme of choosing the regularization parameter. And then I will show um, a, a numerical example, actually just a toy example related to um, EIT. And then later I'll talk about uh, iterative regularization. And also a little theory on it. Uh, we'll, I won't. I don't really plan to really go deep on the mathematical theory on, on this one. Just a little overview, just for everyone to really like capture the idea behind the techniques. And then, and later I'll show also another type of numerical example. So you will see some pictures later. And then I want to start by talking about an important inverse problem that has uh, reached uh, some far long applications. And this is an image called tomography. And it's um, 
an imaging technique by using sections from a, an object of interest and we capture the image from a certain section by penetrating some kind of wave, like for instance, an X-ray, ultrasound, magnetic resonance. So, and it has, uh, and it has been, and this technique has been very helpful, especially in medicine. As you can see, when we have um, brain uh, tomographic brain scans, or, or or from any any scan of any part of our body, especially in the internal organs. Um, it helps us in particular with early detection of diseases as if we check some like important, let's say some tumors on some anywhere in any part of our body. And to get more into detail of this one, here's how actually tomography works. So for instance, uh, if you follow the pointer, suppose um, this um, image here inside the box is the three-dimensional image or rather a three-dimensional object that we are interested to capture an image. So what tomography does is for every section, let's say here, I will let a wave pass through this one. And then when the wave is to the object, it causes some like um, some conduct based on some conductivity um, um, property, the wave changes its behavior once when it passes the object. And then it records that movement here in this section here, like in this image S1. And you do that for any section. And then, so you get um, images from different segments and then you combine those um, se segmented images to, to give, to, to reconstruct an image of the object of interest. And this is the same technique where that we actually use, let's say in MRI, let's say in capturing, uh, in capturing a brain scan, and of course, uh, to make it uh, to make it very helpful to many uh, practitioners, we want the the best image that we can capture. In particular, we want an image that actually contains what we actually need to see. Let's say a particular part of the brain or a tumor somewhere. And the roots behind this technique of tomography actually dates back in let's say around 60s and it's not even in medicine and it's actually from petroleum engineering thanks to this um to, thanks to this um petroleum engineer third mathematician alberto calderon from argentina so he said university he actually wanted to be a mathematician but then his father like advised him to do engineering instead because he will not make so much money when with a math degree sort of so that's what he did. So he, after engineering, he worked at Argentina's National Petroleum Company. And then he worked on a particular problem of determining, the, uh, determining if there is petroleum underground. And that leads him to the earliest form of inverse problem being studied. And that's what we call uh, electrical impedance uh, tomography. So eventually, like uh, just a little background, like after he did it last long in the petroleum company. So what happened? What, so what happened was he left the petroleum company. He he went to uh, Princeton and did more. Got a position there as a, as a professor, and then kept going, kept working as a mathematician. And then he's also now, and also Calderon is now one of the most important names in the inverse problems community. In fact, electrical impedance tomography or EIT is also known as Calderon's problem. So what's the problem Calderon actually worked on? So here's an illustration. So suppose um, we, we were interested on where exactly this petroleum underground is located. So what, um, Cal what, what Calderon did was to first um, to somewhat um, clo enclose this uh, the, the place where we suspect there's a petroleum by some uh, boundaries. And then the idea is that for around the boundary, we put some electrodes and these electrodes will both um, release some voltage and um, electric current towards the object. So, excuse me. So the idea behind EIT is to reconstruct some conductivity underground by taking measurements along the boundary. 
because when we let an electricity pass to the to the underground when the, when it passes through a certain to the petroleum it records some um, it it the movement um, changes because of some con because of the conductivity properties and that's being recorded by another electrode so it's essentially knowing what's actually inside by taking measurements around the boundary and then that's the and that's the, the probably uh, that's also the, one of the earliest forms of inverse problems that were really studied um, on a great mathematical detail so and it's and so um, from, from from engineering it has also been uh, used in let's say um, taking um, scans let's say from from infants because we're just using electricity um, it's not as toxic as using let's say um, x-ray so it's also very useful in taking uh, say, um, early um, early detection of some some any tumor that is found let's say in the babies and essentially for those um, anyone who are quite at, at risk on exposing on too much uh, toxic uh, radiation. And so when describing an inverse problem, it assumes that there is such thing as a direct problem. So in a direct problem, you have a certain cause, you determine the result on an, or the observation. The inverse problem is simply the other way around. Given an observed effect, you check what actually caused such observation. And a more effective way to distinguish these two problems is called ill postness. And in Hadamard sense, so in Hadamard sense, let's define what is ill postness. And it's also, also helpful if we first describe what do we mean by well post, a well post problem. So um, in Hadamard sense, a problem is called well post if it satisfies the three properties. First, if the problem has a solution, it has a unique solution and the solution depends continuously on the data. And this means that if there are small changes in our data, then the solution should also have some small changes on it. If one of, or if at least one of these requirements is violated, then we say that the problem is called ill post. And as I mentioned earlier, inverse problems are inherently um, ill post because in reality, any measurement data that we have is always, uh, is always subject to some um, um, estimation errors or estimation errors or er errors from how the, the certain object, let's say an image has been uh, captured. And let's go and get nitty gritty in the maths behind an inverse problem. So, so mathematically, so now I will introduce some spaces. So if you have an inverse problem, so you determine an unknown quantity, let's, let's call it X from a set of data Y, which is contained in a space Y. Here, um, big X and big Y are Hilbert spaces. If you haven't heard of Hilbert spaces, that's totally fine. Um, just, imagine that, just imagine that all the, um, a quant variables here are in Rn and you're good because Rn is an example of Hilbert spaces, of a Hilbert space. Uh, for those who took analysis, um, you can take the set of um, Lebesgue in integrable functions L2 or the set of infinite sequences, small L2 as uh, examples of Hilbert spaces. And suppose we equip a norm on that Hilbert space. And suppose we only have an um, approximate measured data Y delta such that it's error uh, with respect to y, with respect to the norm in y is bounded by a quantity, a positive quantity delta, which we call the noise level. And the process of obtaining this noisy data is described by this operator equation, a x equals y, where here a is a, is a bounded linear operator from x to y and so given this equation, inverse problems usually deals with given uh, noisy data, uh, y, uh, y delta, you uh, if there is 
uh, uh, you, you capture the parameter x such that it agrees with this um, um, op, uh, model equation or operator equation here. And, and if we, by assuming that this, um, the problem is ill-posed, then this um, operator equation here should be ill-posed. And that means that the inverse of this operator A either does not exist or is not continuous. And lin um, li um, inverse problems um, modeled by a linear equation are essentially um, um, easy to solve. In fact, there's a rich theory already for linear inverse problems. But what I actually um, deal in more detail are nonlinear inverse problems, where instead of a linear operator, we have a nonlinear operator. So we still have the same um, framework here, but we only have an, but we have instead a, a nonlinear operator equation, f of s equals y, and makes uh, nonlinear inverse problems uh, more challenging is because they usually uh, we need more assumptions on the on on the forward operator here. So he, again, here f is a nonlinear operator such that so these um, standard assumptions hold first uh, the nonlinear operator f and its facie derivative, or let's just call it here derivative f prime, and they are continuous. And then the values of the derivative are bounded for all points at some uh, ball, say a Euclidean ball. And then you have this, uh, we let this, assume that this uh, operator F here um, satisfies what we call a tangential cone conditions. And to get uh, just a little overview on what, it is, what is this term here, this term on the left side of the inequality is simply the linearization error of the, of the forward operator F with respect to the point X and the tangential condition simply holds, tells us that the linearization error is bounded by this guy here on the right side. But what I just, the point that what I want to make here is that you need to have more uh, assumptions on the forward operator F for nonlinear inverse problems compared when you just have uh, a linear equation. And a lot of inverse problems are there can be modeled by a nonlinear equation such as this one. And then I wanna talk about now the first um, uh, regularization method. In fact, the more popular uh, regular, in fact, most popular regularization method as far as applications are concerned. And this is called the uh, Tikhonov regularization. Um, it's named after a, the Russian uh, Tikhonov. And for those doing stats or machine learning, it's also known as ridge regression, essentially the same thing. But what I want to present here is uh, the, the more general um, framework. And then later I will show it on the more uh, specific types of framework. And here, so suppose we have topological spaces. So it could be Banach space or Hilbert space. So it's not, that's why it's generalized. So we want to capture all those uh, different spaces out there. And suppose we have their, their respective topologies, tau q and tau u. And we consider inverse problems of the following form. Here in this equation, um, u dagger is an um, exact data. And f here, we allow the forward operator f here could as either linear or nonlinear. And then we let small q here as the parameter to be determined. And then this um, functional j as the data misfit functional. So in this equation, it tells us that the misfit or discrepancy between the exact data and the uh, reconstructed data using the parameter Q must be equal to zero. And because we want to capture study ill pulse problems, suppose instead of the exact data, we only have a noisy data uh, denoted by U till. And then, to, because this is already um, ill post, so to stabilize this problem, 
we introduce a suitable penalty functional denoted by R that maps from Q to the set of non-negative real numbers. So the choice of penalty functional actually depends on any prior information on the parameter that you, you want to determine. And later I will show some, some exa important examples of this penalty functionals. So with that penalty functional, the ticket of regularization for finding the solution of this um, equation here is given by this minimization problem. So notice the dysfunctional here is simply the misfit plus the value of the penalty term times a, con uh, a non negative number alpha called the regularization, the regularization parameter. And given this um, generalized framework, um, this has been well studied, especially on the early parts of the first decade of the 2000s. We can refer you later to these um, uh, references here. And a more well-studied example is when the data space U is a banner space and this also um, captures already, let's say the Lebesgue integral spaces LP where P um, can be uh, e uh, greater than or equal to one. And then we have the misfit functional be simply the norm on the Banach space U. So that again, the, so the purpose of the penalty functional here is to, um, to, to find a stable solution of the inverse problem that we are looking for. And later I will discuss how we actually choose this regularization parameter because that's actually a crucial part of my uh, research. And from topological spaces, I want to now get uh, deeper in more specific types of um, topological spaces. In fact, for instance, if we have, we set the generalized, regular, uh, generalized t, t, t kind of regularization in Hilbert spaces, and then we can simply write the variational or take on a regularization on the following form, where we set the penalty functional be equal to the difference between the parameter Q and a prior estimate or initial estimate of the uh, parameter Q that we are looking for. And we can simply actually raise the misfit value here for square. And in particular, what the regularization parameter does is to like give a compromise between minimizing the data misfit and keeping the penalty term small in order to enforce a stability on this problem. And later, uh, um, I, will, uh, I will show that this has to be fine-tuned. There's no such thing as one value of regularization parameter that fits all types of uh, problems that we're looking for. In fact, it's actually very crucial on how, it's very crucial on how you actually choose the regularization parameter. And such rule must be somewhat um, practical. And in fact, I just wanna show that if our F here is a bounded linear operator A, then the minimizer of this function here, I forgot to mention that this only works if Q tilde is zero, then we, then for, for linear, I just wanna say that for linear operators, the minimizer be actually, um, can be actually um, explicitly um, um, written in this form. Here, so you have an in you, you just compute the inverse of this operator here times a star times u tilde u, and for more info about that term here, it's actually very well studied. You can actually check this reference key reference here on regularization. It's called this book here by Engel, Hanke, and Neubauer, published back in two thousand. But in my research, I want to actually generalize the theory on this regularization scheme. Now, why do we actually bother generalizing the theory on regularization? First, in Hilbert space, um, it captures problems that are actually too uh, are actually nice looking, but Hilbert spaces are, can, are, can actually be too smooth for many problems. And geometrically, 
And then this makes Bannock spaces more suitable because you can capture um, solutions that are actually uglier looking. Or what I mean with uglier is that they actually have non-smooth um, properties, such for instance, if uh, the solution that we're looking for is sparse, that means it has only few non-zero components. Or if the problem we're looking for is piecewise constant, and when our observed data is contaminated with some non-Gaussian noise. And, an and also an an another motivation is that a lot of, in applications, there are lots of mis data misfit functional or discrepancy functionals or similarity measures, and they are cannot be expressed as norms. And so that means um, Banach spaces will not be suitable for these type of examples. And an example of those misfit functionals that I will not actually in particular, but probably you've heard some of them here are actually a weighted LP norms, uh, the Kullback library divergence for those doing probably that uh, data science or some probability, probably you've heard of these um, metric sailors such as logistic loss and probability measures. But what I just want to point out is that um, this, these applications actually uh, mo motivate generalizing the existing theory on regularization. Which, which is actually a rich area for research. Now, in exactly, that's actually what I do in this research. And in my, in particular, um, I actually tried to generalize the theory here, still in topological, still in topological spaces, but I want to get rid of the need of a forward operator. So instead of the one that I actually presented earlier, we let's on, only consider the inverse problems of the following form. Here we only have Q. And then we don't, and we, we simply do not pass Q here to another forward operator. And then here, I just changed the notation. S here is still our misfit functional. And then our taken of regularization now becomes the following, which is still this essentially the same. But the only difference now is um, instead of imposing some assumptions on the forward operator F, we only we on, we don't have to think about it anymore. We only have to think on the assumptions on the misfit functional S, and of course in the assumptions on the penalty functional R. And then what I did in my research is to show that this converge by given a parameter choice rule for the regularization parameter. I want to uh, actually prove that this um, regularization this framework here converges. And in particular, it should approximate well a unique minimizing R minimizing solution Q dagger. So that means Q dagger here satisfies the inverse problem. And it also gives us the minimum value of the penalty functional R. And as I mentioned earlier, um, actually it discovers a lot, a broader range of um, inverse problems. And then I haven't actually, and I wanted to discuss now, how do we actually choose the regularization parameter alpha? And this is actually what um, uh, rule that I actually worked on. And this is actually called the Hang Krauss uh, heuristic rule. So just want to show, uh, just an overview of this one. So if you have uh, given some fixed parameters, big A and alpha naught, and then and some this constant here, gamma, be given. And then we take the value, the possible values of the regularization parameter on this uh, discrete exponential grid. So this is essentially a sequence of uh, a decreasing sequence of numbers. And then we define the optimal regularization parameter alpha star such that alpha star minimizes this uh, heuristic functional theta. And look, uh, if you look at this uh, for all alpha in the discrete exponential grid, and notice alpha here, its key ingredient is, of course the music functional, and then you have the noisy data and the regularized solution Q tilde alpha. And so correction that should be U tilde. So, what we, so notice here, the only thing you need on this, reg, uh, on this parameter choice rule is simply the noisy data. And I want to emphasize that we don't need here the noise level here. 
And the idea of this rule here is this functional theta serves as a surrogate to the approximation error. Because in practice, you cannot compute the approximation error if you do not know the actual solution we're looking for, because we only have the observed data here. So in theory, um, this serves as a surrogate. So if you find the, min the minimizer of this one, um, we also find, um, we have a good chance that we also find the, minima the minimizer of the approximation error with this rule here. And just a little um, overview of the result that we got here is I proved the regularization parameter, uh, rather the regularization property of this um, uh, regularization scheme. And in particular, this means that if I have a family noise, a family of noisy data such that this noisy, this family of noisy data converges to a to the exact data as the noise level decays to zero. And in addition, if if we assume that the this noise family of noisy data satisfies the noise condition given here, it simply tells us that the noise level is bounded above, or in other way around, the this, this, the discrepancy here for all uh, param values of the parameter is bounded below by a multiple of the noise level. And it has been shown that for most inverse problems, although it, you can actually verify this one, this is actually satisfied. Um, and then by given um, uh, assumptions on the penalty functional and then the misfit functional, we, can, we have shown that the, by this heuristic rule, the regularized solutions converge to the, the R minimizing solution on the topology of Q as the, the noise level uh, convergence to zero. And sorry, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have actually presented the results in this paper here, which is co-authored with um, the, my collaborators here along with my supervisor here and it's due to appear hopefully before the year ends. And then um, just to show a numerical example, uh, just an overview. So just to show a particular example on the electrical impedance tomography. So what we actually do here in EIT is to determine the conductivity Q in this elliptic region here by virtue of a family of uh, Cauchy data, which see, is simply com, com, which is at, uh, composed by two sets of measurements along the boundary of the, our bound, bounded open domain. And that's given by the boundary voltage F of L, which is simply the value of the, um, the observation U in H1, which is, which is a sublev space. Uh, I will discuss in detail what's a sublev space here, this one. So that's one. It's a we given the boundary voltage U in the boundary of omega, and given the current flux GL, we find we need to determine the conductivity Q in this um, elliptic equation. And just to um, aid us in getting the result, we assume that Q lies on this unbounded set where the values of the, the function values of Q is bounded by bounded above and below by these uh, constants here. And just, I just want to uh, give an overview on how we actually apply uh, variational regularization here. So first, since we have here these two different types of data, we treat them separately and then solve the elliptic equation given these uh, two types of boundary data. The first one is the Dirichlet solution. So Given the boundary that boundary measurements f, we let uh, u d be the weak solution of this elliptic equation here, subject to the Dirichlet boundary condition u equals f on the boundary, and that's why it's called Dirichlet solution because it, we use here the Dirichlet boundary. And alternatively, we can use the weak form of this PDE. Um, an overview, um, what the weak form does of a PDE is it allows us to solve discontinuous solutions of our original PDE. 
in terms of the test functions here, theta. So we take the one boundary problem here in this uh, PDE problem. And then another problem is the Neumann solution. So given the Neumann boundary condition, or in particular, given the current flux G, we denote uh, UN be the weak solution of this PDE, to the same PDE actually, subject to the Neumann boundary condition. And we solve this problem along the space of the solution U with vanishing boundary mean, which means that the, the integral of the value of U along the boundary is zero based on this um, uh, set here, H1 delta. So the idea is we solve this solution here, or we solve this PDE problem here, we solve the Neumann problem here, and then we combine those solutions in our state functional. And this is given by the following. So notice here, it's this integral here resembles like an LP solution. Um, this uh, misfit, um, uh, this misfit um, uh, value here is taken in terms of the Cauchy data here. In fact, a sequence of Cauchy data taken on big L different boundary measurements. And then, and this is actually like, um, so we have this um, difference here between the Dirichlet and Neumann solution, in fact, the gradient multiplied by the parameter Q. And then, so if we have an exact data F dagger, the EIT probably now becomes solving this um, misfit, uh, this equation here. And in fact, for noisy data, and because we suppose if you only have a noisy data, be given F tilde and G tilde, this is now how the parallel, this is now how the taken of regularization looks like. We have this minimization problem here, plus alpha times the value of the misfit functional R at Q. And then we I'll show now some figures uh, relating to the numerical, uh, to this problem here. And then we actually use the total variation for this one. And these are some of the overview of the numerical solution that we have. So let me just zoom in on this one. So suppose this is the exact um, solution that we are looking for. As you can see, it's piecewise constant. And we, so we use the total variation function here. And then we, um, so showed also, we also show here the values of the heuristic function which serve as the surrogate of the approximation error. And this is now why the regularization parameter must be carefully fine-tuned. Because if we, so we pick a parameter that's either big or too small, then the approximation error here might be really big. So we have to fine tune it here. And given the, this, and these three plots here actually relates to the different values of the combination of parameters that we do. But we just wanna show here that without using any information on the noise level, we can actually help capture, we can actually accurately capture the exact solution we actually look for. Sorry about that, here. So, that's one of the numerical, uh, this is just one of the numerical simulations that we did in this um, problem here. So again, if you recall in taken of uh, regularization, given a regularization parameter alpha, you need to solve the minimization problem. So in other words, you have to complete one an entire optimization scheme to get the regularization solution for every uh, regularization parameter. In applications, you need to try as many regularization parameters as possible, and that's computationally expensive. And that's one major drawback of taking of regularization. So there is an alternative that actually is computationally, uh, computationally cheap, but it's um, but it although it takes a longer time it takes longer time but it 
it's computationally cheap. So there's a trade-off there. And this, this is, again, another classes of iter, it, iterative methods that I studied. And these are called iterative methods. And in particular, I focused on the Land Weber method, which is simply, which is nothing but a gradient scheme for solving this least squares problem here, give, given here for, and here we use the framework on the any norm space, Banach or uh, Hilbert space. So here, instead of adding a penalty functional here, we just run the gradient, the gradient scheme here to solve the problem. So how it works, so I'll just show you some uh, the behind here. So suppose X and Y are Banach spaces and we do not uh, X star and Y star by the, their respective dual spaces. And same as in the previous framework, uh, suppose we only have an approximate data Y delta and suppose we have a noise level delta here. And we now consider inverse problems in terms of a forward equation F. So here we need a, the forward equation now, unlike in the previous result. Here F is a, we allow F to be either linear or nonlinear equation. And, and we assume that the operator satisfies these key assumptions here. Suppose we assume that F is weakly closed. And then suppose we have a family of bounded linear operators L that are bounded and then it satisfies again this uh, tangential cone property. But what we actually um, generalize here is we allow L to be any operator that behave not just the derivative but any operator that behaves like the derivative. And then um, I'll, later I will show some notation here. Um, the small jry, if you, you will see later, is simply a selection of the duality mapping jr. Um, I will um, discuss later uh, in, uh, what's the uh, duality mapping here. But the idea here is that because from the noisy data, you need to pass it further to the dual space before you actually go back to the parameter space. And that's what the duality mapping does. And then I uh, will now show the the, the land web method given a convex penalty functional. So same as vari variation in taken of regularization, we still need the convex penalty functional so, the, so that we can capture those transmit solution. So uh, we start with an initial guess, let's say psi naught, and suppose we have this positive constants here, and, or in fact relaxation constants, because that's what they serve here. And suppose we have X not be this guy here, which is a, a solution to this minimization problem here. And by this in, initializations here, and this is how it works. First, we compute the step size, which is given by this one. Uh, don't be, um, there's, there's so much terms here, but this um, step size here is nothing but a multiple of the residual here Notice this is the residual. It's the difference between the noisy data and uh, the reconstructed data in terms of the parameter x and delta times this uh, uh, constant here. This step size is chosen such that the difference in the error between two successive iterates is to a minimum. Romel, you're lost. Romel. Romel, are you? I think. Yeah, I think he lost his connection. Probably he can just uh, sign back in. Pangit ang connection sa Australia, eh, kasi ganon talaga. <laughs> Actually, in Davao City. No, he's back in Davao. Ah, nasa Davao pala siya. Okay, guys. Oo, nasa bahay siya. Um. Alright, that's sad. But uh, we can we can do it again. Yeah, let's just let's wait for a while for for him to uh, come back. Yeah, sige, sige. Sige. While waiting for Romel, um, 
Kamustahan muna tayo. How's uh, Davao, Mayang? <laughs> Davao is alright, except na... <laughs> Um, no, right, sorry, sorry, to but, um, sorry to butt in, but are we still live on YouTube while waiting for uh, no, Romel? Okay, yes, Romel's back. Yes, Romel's back. Okay. Hi, Romel. Romel, Romel, if you unmute Romel, uh, please unmute yourself. Nakamute ka pa, Romel. Okay, sige. Yeah. To answer the question of Alexis, yes, we are still on uh, live on YouTube, but it's okay. okay. This okay, happened. <laughs> Yeah, okay. this happens. Wait, uh, I'm live. Sorry about the technical uh, difficulty. Again, Romel, please, uh, please proceed your talk. No problem. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Uh, wait, um, wait uh, uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Yeah, we, we yeah. can. We can. Okay, I can cool. hear you well here. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Same so, here. Uh, uh, okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's continue a bit. So, yeah. So, here, um, this is the set of iterative equations that we do so I'll just um this can you, you have to share screen share screen oh. yeah oh oops sorry uh, it's fine uh, yeah i know uh, parang ma ano ma anong tawag nito uh, we are kind of like into the detail you know like we're yeah. as a plot <laughs> yeah yeah um sige lang sige lang okay na Probably it, it would be better if you kind of like refresh uh mga sure. natin, five seconds or yeah yeah sure uh, no problem. A little bit, yeah. yeah sure no problem yeah okay so uh, I hope you can see the screen now so yeah let's let's continue so so this is how an iterative um scheme uh works in fact in the Land Weber method same as in the gradient scheme or gradient method if you've run one so first you start with an initial guess psi naught we don't have any restrictions here. You just pick any initial solution. And then we select some positive constants, mu zero and mu one, which serves as a relaxation to our step size. And then we take P greater than equal to two and R greater than equal to one. And then we set X zero be equal to this value here. In fact, the solution to this minimization problem. And then we let we, by this initializations here, and then we compute the following step size. So notice here, mu O and mu one takes the role here. And they serve as relaxation constant. They like fine tuning the step size so it can you can run the method as fast as possible. And this step size here is nothing but a multiple of the a power of the residual given by the norm of the difference between the y delta and the uh, we constructed um, data f of x n times this um, fella here. And then we then compute the following set of equations. So what the first equation does is simply a gradient step. So uh, nothing really new here, it's just a gradient step. And take note, it requires all the computations done from the previous iteration. That's why you have only here in the indices x small n and then you take that and take the, this value here as your current dual solution. And then you pass the dual solution here to this next set of equation, which is simply a minimization problem in terms of the penalty functional R. Later, I will, see, I will, I will show how, how this looks like in actual values of R, of the penalty functional R. So you have this um, parameter uh, iterative equation here. So you run and then for every new solution xn plus one, you check a parameter choice rule to accept if, do we stop here in xn plus one? If you think the solution is not good enough, we run again until we uh, satisfy a parameter choice rule. And then, we, and then when we think it's already good, then we take xn plus one as an approximate solution of the inverse problem of concern. Now. I want to show now some very specific prop, um, ex, um, versions of this um, Land Weber method. So if we restrict, if we only consider Hilbert spaces and then we let only the penalty functional as nothing but the squared norm of X. And then it can, we can show that the classical Land Weber, the, and whatever method in Banach spaces here can simply reduce one equation, which is this one. And this is the classical nonlinear Land Weber iteration on Hilbert spaces, where you where you only have one equation to run. And 
And similar to the, the icon of regularization, the number of iterations n now serves as the regularization parameter. That means you cannot, you have to run an appropriate number of iterations in real, in, to really get the, the best approximate solution that you can get. And the most well-studied parameter choice rule, or in this context, a stopping criterion for this one, for this iterative scheme is called the discrepancy principle. And this discrepancy principle tells us to terminate this land Weber method after n delta iterations when the computed discrepancy becomes less than a multiple of the noise level for the first time. So when you run this set of equations, you check the residual. If you satisfy this one, you stop. Otherwise, you keep running until you stop this one. And notice here, we need two important things to run this um, principle. First, the noise level and the noisy data. And then the convergence of this method, of this land Weber method on Hilbert spaces has been established back in 95 by Hanke and Bauer and Schelzer. And in fact, the convergence of the method for Banach spaces, the one that I presented earlier, under the same discrepancy principle was, was uh, established back in 2013. And it uses these two main assumptions concerning the Banach space Y, which is our data space. And we assume that it's uniformly continuous. And then another assumption it concerns with the continuity of this um, operator here, L. Now, in my research, we obtain the convergence analysis without using these two main assumptions. And these are some of the motivations. First, there are instances your noise is not contaminated by a non-Gaussian noise. Let's say an impulse noise, you have a uniform noise. So that's why L1 space or L infinity space are more suitable for those problems. And they violate the uniform smoothness of a Banach space. And in some instances, the forward operator may not be smooth. And that's actually what I did in my research, obtaining the convergence analysis of this method by in a more relaxed setting. And it, we are, we, we're due to publish it sometime, hopefully before the year ends. Um, and if you, if, you want, if you have the preprint of that paper, you can just uh, message me if you want. And then in particular, as part of my PhD, I also, we also proved the convergence of the, the land weather method in Banach spaces using a version of the heuristic rule that I mentioned earlier, which simply tells us to choose the stopping index n star such that it's the minimizer of this uh, heuristic um, functional, which same as in tickle of regularization only requires the noise, le noise level. And still the, this uh, hand closed um, functional here is nothing but a multiple of the residual, which is computable. And then that's, what I, then that's also what I did in my uh, research. And now I wanna show now quickly some important parts of the method here. And notice here, an important ingredient here is the choice of the penalty functional R. And if, if we consider the parameter space as L2 space, and let's, if we consider a penalty functional with an L1 penalty given by this one, so you have the sum of the quadratic term plus this L1 L1 norm on LP space, then the minimizer of this one here is now given by the soft thresholding, um, soft thresholding operator. So, because in L1 using an L1 penalty, we assume that the solution is sparse. So, what the soft thresholding does is it applies a soft thresholding scheme to the dual space such that for the values on the, du on the dual solution that are too small for both positive and negative, they are, they, they are compressed to zero. That's why we have this one. So, we, so the top the solding only compresses uh, most of the values to zero and leaves out some no a few non-zero components. And this is actually, so for L1 penalty, we have an explicit, explicit way of computing 
this value here in the minimization step. Another more important one that I mentioned earlier is the total variation functional. So here, in, suppose we have this R penalty functional here, which, is, which involves the total variation functional TV, then this minimization problem here becomes the total variation denoising problem or also known as the ROF model named after the mathematicians that devised this method. And what the total variation does is to solve this minimization problem, which resembles something like the taken of regularization scheme. So in the total variation here, we, uh, we denoise the dual solutions such that we weed out those unwanted details while we retain those important ones such as um, boundaries and stuff like that. And there is no um, explicit solution here, but we can solve this efficiently by some existing numerical algorithms. And that's what makes this one um, a bit more computationally um, expensive. And now I wanna show now an example of the blurring. So we reconstruct an unknown image X dagger from an observed image Y delta, which is downgraded by a linear convolution blurring operator F plus a salt and pepper noise V. And that makes the, the noisy data here very um, erratic. And because the image that normally Im um, images um, have some periodic boundary conditions. So ideally we use a uh, total variation the blurring. So we choose this, fa this um, penalty functional here where this norm here is simply the Frobenius norm. And then I wanna go straight to the numerical um, results, actually the graph that I actually obtained here. So uh, I want you to bring this edge here. We have the original picture here. And this is the observed noisy data where it's simply the blurred picture sprinkled with salt and pepper noise. That's why it's called salt and pepper. It's like you have an image and then you sprinkle salt and pepper and then you get that one. And then these are the results using the discrepancy principle. Take note the discrepancy principle requires the noise level. While these two here are the, the ones obtained by using the the uh, hand cross um, uh, a heuristic rule, both do not, do not require a noisy data. And I want to, to bring your attention here to this graph of the heuristic function of theta. And this um, justifies the need to terminate the iterative scheme accordingly, because if you take too many iterations, then you might actually um, make the approximation worse. And Although this is this still needs some fine tuning, this also tells us that um, you don't really you, you you cannot really tell how many iterations you will see because you don't really we have limited data on inverse problems. But if you compare by the by with by comparing by the naked eye, this two reconstructions here are actually pretty good enough compared to this one here, which is actually somewhat better than these two here. But the idea here is even without using the noise level, we can actually compute, um, we can actually reconstruct um, images. And this is very important in applications because if you er erroneously um, um, estimate the noise level, then you might actually have a poor reconstruction of the image that look. Just to summarize everything here, so I'll just show what, is, what can still be done here. So as um, we observe in our research, um, the Landweber method is somewhat computationally uh, cheap, but of iterations. And the remedy for that one is to apply some acceleration schemes so for the land web iteration. And this still needs some further study. In fact, there's some ongoing research on how do we apply um, land uh, ac uh, acceleration schemes such as nested acceleration and multiple search directions such that they, it can take and save more time. And of course, in uh, 
context of regularization theory, you want to um, obtain convergence results using more relaxed environments so that we can cover more wider, wider range of examples. And another thing that hasn't got much assumptions is that methods that avoid some para, uh, forward operator and that scheme will be very uh, useful for time dependent inverse problems. And another one that I am currently um, working on is applying some iterative regularization schemes for inverse problems with non-negative solutions. This is very useful in statistics because there are lots of problems out there where the observed quantity is inherent or, or, or the observed um, parameter is inherently non-negative. And these are some of the, some references that you might actually want to consider. The first one here is essentially the main reference for regularization. Everything here is on Hilbert spaces. The one here on the last one takes all the results here on the more general result in Banach spaces. And this uh, can also check out some of the papers here for more specific types of um, topics. And then thank you for listening and yeah, thank, and hope you learned something from it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Romel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we can go now to the uh, questions and uh, questions uh, and answer forum. But uh, before okay. that, uh, yung ginagawa natin traditionally, all people in the Zoom meeting should open their video camera. <laughs> yes. Turn on your camera. Okay. Where are you guys? Turn on. Sandali lang. Sandali lang. <laughs> uh, Peter is here. Uh, I think nagkasabay si Peter at si Romel daw sa ANU. Uh -oh. Yeah. Hey, hey Hello, Peter. Yeah, Hello. Hey, Pe hey Peter. Nandun ka pa rin ba sa kwarto ko? Huh? Nandun ka pa rin ba nagsistay sa kwarto ko o lumipat ka na sa university uh, house? Oo, oh, oh, pinalipat kami actually. Ah, nga pala. Dahil nga pala sa ano? Yung may renovation. Oh, daw, may hailstorm kasi. Tapos yun na, na, na giba yung bubong. Ay, yung, toko yun. ah. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> yun. Oo, oh, nga pala. Nga pala. <laughs> Ngay. So, saan ka na ngayon? Sa graduate house? Wala, sa ibang residence. Ah, sa so parang... Campus. Oh, wow. Ako, hirap pa kasi. Pero um, nasa Davao ka, Romel? Or... Actually, nasa Davao nasa, ko ngayon. Nasa Davao nga siya ngayon. Oh. Oh. Um, he's back. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Wait. So, 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 so what? Pero you're currently, pero you're currently, ano, PhD student sa Australia, no? Yes, yes, exactly. It's almost yeah. done, I think. Right, Romel? Yeah. Uh, Defended yeah. your dissertation, ah? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's in my supervisor and then I'm just waiting for some comments on him. Like, I've written, like, the whole dissertation. Ah, uh, uh, okay. And I'll just wait for him and then we, we, tar we target to submit it to the referees probably in in a month or two depends on how satisfied are we <laughs> para habol ka sa december graduation ano um yeah sana <laughs> <laughs> okay siguro uh, we can proceed now to the question and answer forum sino sino ba yung may questions i uh, sir ren is here hi sir ren hello hi hi yeah. Mara. hi romel Hi, yes, oh, ang ng background. Hi, yes, sir. <laughs> Hello, hi, hi. And si Mang Kayan is also here. And Sir Al, ayaw nyo i-audio yes. yung inyong camera. Si, si Mang Kayan, oh, ano daw, sabihin ko Mang Kayan, nakakagaling oh, mo doon ang exercise. Hi. <laughs> Hello, it's good to see you all. Hi. I think, I think uh, uh, my question si Sir Ren. Uh, oh, yes. Sir Ren, uh, oh, no. hi, sir. Hi. So actually, uh, nag-work ako sa EIT. Oh, cool. Um, so, ang question ko kasi usually sa EIT ay yung um, tag dito, raw I zero. Okay. So, uh, that, so parang kapag mayroon ka doon sa um, Dirichlet problem, di ba mayroon kang yeah. Dirichlet tsaka Neumann? Dahil yeah. zero, zero, um, hindi ba magiging zero na si U doon sa Dirichlet problem kapag zero, zero? <laughs> I'm sorry, kung zero yung... Uh, uh, yung right-hand side ng elliptic equation. Di ba meron ka uh, doon negative divergence ng uh, uh, sigma delta u equals rho? Um, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think... Um, kung magiging zero siya, bak, um, I think... Um, 
I think when we uh, study this problem, maybe it, um, I'm, I'm not sure actually, I'm, I'm actually not sure if it will be uh, zero, but I think if you consider only, if you only solve the weak, uh, 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 if you only solve the weak formulation, then I think it could actually allow you to capture even those non-zero solutions in the problem. Yeah, I hope. And I mean, because I, I don't yeah. know. Siguro sa references. Uh, Kahit don sa ane. Eh, yeah. Uh, Calderon's paper zero yung zero yung uh, 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 right, yeah. ah zero yung right hand side. And um uh, yeah. Tapos I usually kasi sa EIT merong ibat ibang models. No? So meron kang yeah. uh, continuum. Tapos meron kang um uh, shunt. Tapos meron kang complete. No. So yung complete yung more um more um sort of realistic. So meron uh, uh, so, so doon sa sa boundary data mo, meron kang, di ba meron kang um, current, no? So current mo ata ay FL ba? Tama o GL? Uh, yeah, G. G. So G, parang G, meron G, kang additional na contact impedance kasi pag naglay ka ng electrode, hindi uh, naman siya sort, may, merong, merong loss ng current um, mm, dahil ay pag naglay ka ng electrode sa boundary, pagpasok uh, ng current, pag transfer niya sa skin, may, na, may, na, may nalulose na, na current. Yan tawag uh, sort of um, contact impedance. Pwede mo siyang i-consider kasi ay magkakaroon ka lang ng more boundary condition pero ah, okay. uh, uh, unique naman yung solution ng, um, ng uh, forward problem. Ah, okay, so you you essentially have uh, an, an additional aside from the Neumann boundary so, and yeah, the Dirichlet? So meron, meron kang Neumann boundary doon sa kung nasan yung electrode. Tapos uh, sa mga walang electrode, i-assume mo na zero. Kasi ah, pag mag- di ba yung 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 paglalagay naman ng ng electrodes hindi naman siya sa buong boundary may mga portion uh, may mga mm, portion lang ng boundary na nakalagay yung um yung uh, electrodes so dun sa ah, portion, na, portion na walang electrode ya assume mo na uh, zero yung um uh, ah. current tapos dun sa mga may electrode um uh, yeah ah uh, so you kind of split the Neumann boundary that, I mean the points where you satisfy the uh, Neumann boundary sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we can act, probably in the formulation we can actually like add that. But yeah, I'll probably I'll figure it out. Maybe you can. Maybe we can. Are, are you active actively working on it now? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, I. Uh, 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 okay. sa, sa dissertation kong ahi reader I see Professor Carlton Bakker. Kasama siya dun sa. <laughs> ah, ah, oh, really? Oh, cool. Tapos sila sila uh, Neubauer sila. Na, dun sila sa ane eh, sa sa Linz sa Austria. So medyo strong uh, kasi sa Austria yung Oh, mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. Then. Yeah, I agree. Tapos yeah. I si Pwede mo rin tingnan yung kay um kay Bredis. Hindi ko lang ako nakita mo siya. Pero meron silang pinopost na um, generalization ng total variation. Ang tawag nila ay total generalized variation. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. I'll, uh, 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 yung hindi lang siya, 'di ba doon sa ano mo sa sa regularization term mo parang integral ng Uh, more mm. me, parang variation lang, no? So, ah, parang yeah. ma-define nila yon para not necessarily ay sa TV. So, na-propose nila. Ah, oh, I see. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah, very, very interesting yung work. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thanks. Okay, who else has questions? Pwede mo tanong. Ah, si. Thanks, si sir. I think someone's missing his hand. I think uh, Peter has a question. Go ahead. Hi. Hello, Romel. Kamusta? Hi, Slong. Hi, Slong. Ano, um, si- since I'm also dealing with the stats here, eh, siguro, uh, uh, I see a lot of parallels, eh, with, especially uh, with respect to yung ginagawa namin in terms of the uh, regularization in the yung sinasabi ng Tikon of which I recognize as rich regression of sorts. Yeah. And uh, I believe yung sa lasso would be just the use of, yung lasso would be just regularization on L1. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and more recently, there has been this goal nga to combine the two. Siguro for me in the uh, stat, oh, yun nga, you showed one way na pinagsama mo yung, uh, yung definition mo ng regularization is a functional with which has the square term which is generally a, mm-hmm. a form of ridge and then mm-hmm. the in combination with the ano what do you call this um the linear ano 
whichever loo. The okay. term for the lasso. Okay. So that's it's common naman to mix na recently. Uh, okay. Siguro for me yung ano lang is most of your discussion was all about in terms of the parameter fit, fitting parameters or mm -hmm. fitting the functional structure within the data. Pero siguro ang nagiging ano ko lang is what if there is this uh, problem with respect to overfitting of which napakita uh, mo naman yung idea of that. Pero it's also a concern of ano yung nangyayari with overfitting the data uh, na I uh, don't believe especially with time de with time dependent data of which I'm also working oh. on na uh, medyo pangit pag magpo-forecast ka and you're overfitting at pangit yung forecast mo in the future. Siguro one thing to uh, look into especially with time dependence. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, actually this um the framework here actually um excludes time dependent inverse problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> so time dependent problems are like uh, you have to, you have actually have like more things to consider in theory and so far I haven't yeah. actually worked. But yeah, then, I understand. But in yeah. just in the idea then because yeah. a big problem well it's it's really uh it's uh, malpractice in data science I would say that sometimes yeah. some some do not uh do not look at the overfitting that's happening of which you've shown uh, one example in the filtering pero mm. that is like par ano fitting para in in the form of statistics that seems like estimating what could be the parameters pero mm -hmm, yeah. once you go to like prediction Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, iba na kasi naging concern doon. Ah, okay. So prediction for one, which is yun nga, yung ginagamit yung mga probability metrics, logistic mm -hmm. loss, kubak uh, So yun lang yung parang something for me to think about looking with respect to your research as the stepping stone to where it could lead forward. Ah, I see. Yeah, 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 thanks a lot. Yeah, but I, actually I haven't studied deeply those um, probability metrics. They're actually relatively new uh, in my case. So... Uh, probably, I hope I can work on those. I could suggest parts. certain initial books in that aspect. Yes, uh, no worries at all. Sige. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Nice comment, Peter. Uh, okay, so uh, next next person who will ask is, I think, Sir Ao. Are you there? Yes. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Romel's uh, presentation. That's really nice. Uh, I have uh, two Hi. comments or um probably uh, more on the implementation part because oh, sure. the theory is uh, really uh, well structured but uh, if you work with real data real problem mm -hmm. most of the times uh, theory fails because you have a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. so it's really well structured now i just have uh, some question regarding uh, the data that you use uh, so normally uh, you have an though you already mentioned about the non Gaussian noise and the Gaussian noise, but in reality, you don't know the noise that's inherent in the data. So, normally, uh -huh. what you do is you just assume, oh, there's a white noise there, so the Gaussian noise there. So, uh, mm -hmm. do you have some filtering first or like uh, the smoothing of the data before you put it in the um, minimization problem? So, that's my first question. And the second is, uh, in this regard, most of the times uh, I could see that uh, the computational domain is always uh, um, rectangle or, or, uh, or square. Have you tried uh, using like circle or an irregular polygon? Because the boundary conditions there will vary. And that is more meaningful when you look at uh, tomography, for example, because you don't, know, uh, you don't know the noise that you will get from data and uh, the structure is not perfect uh, square it's it's not the domain is not uh, circle for example and then uh, the the objects that are uh, you are looking inside uh, they are not regular so um can you, well i i think some of the groups are actually considering it uh, but i don't know the theory will be more messy in that regard and uh, implementation i mean pag regular na nga yung mga boundaries most uh, very computationally expensive na. Mm -hmm. So siguro, um, maybe you can just give some comments on those two aspects, uh, the data and the domain, uh, computational domain. Ah, okay, sure. Um, yung sa first equation, first question about if we actually uh, smoothen the data, um, and the, the examples that, the examples that we actually consider here are like essentially uh, toy problems. 
so that they could somewhat uh, re resemble any actual uh, problem. And in that imaging problem, yeah, we just assume that it's already it it already uh, looks uh, it 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 already looks nice. And then for the purpose of uh, illustration on the algorithm, we just like added a apply the blurring ski uh, operator and then just added a uh, no yeah, and, and just added on the noise uh, in any uh, noise like uh, salt and pepper so of course in a, a application um you have you really have no idea what kind of noise got in to your image but at least um in but somehow you can only like like as uh, you can somewhat um, only assume that it it could be, it, it uh, somewhat you can only assume that it behaves the uh, noise uh, with this kind of noise, and because of that in that context where you don't really have so much data and you don't really know if the problem you're working on satisfies the following assumptions, um, that's what yeah. You need to somewhat um, generalize the theory on on in this case in the regularization theory for more um, in a more general uh, for in, in a more general settings where you have more relaxed and more fewer assumptions on the on, on the problem. So that's um, so and also um, the problem here doesn't also assume like. What what sort of numerical schemes that you get? What on, uh, the theory only tells us that as long as you use this sort of, if you satisfy these uh, assumptions and then you apply this parameter choice rule, then your method can actually work. In fact, um, there's still like a lot of gaps to fill to be filled in between the the theory and application. But in in some applications, actually, um, um not so many. Like in some um uh, imaging techniques, you can actually uh, verify the assumptions on the problem that we actually imposed. Uh, luckily, you can. And then you uh, saw regular in a domain, like for instance, in the EIT, I think we actually considered um, irregular domain. But so far in our um, sim in, so far in our simulations, we only we are only considered like a, a, it's a rectangle. We only considered the circle. Um, so far, we haven't actually um, considered those kind of domain and take um, here we only assume that the domain that we have is uh, but but I think as long as the the domain could is uh, 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 bounded then I think I think the that we here should all actually agree with the um, application that we have but yeah it's actually um, important that we like actually apply this um, the this uh, regularization schemes for a uh, high more a uh, wider set of of examples uh, yeah, yeah that's why what that's also what we also consider for those people working on the theory where we don't only present the theory we also need to show some like uh, actual application like at least one or two so that to see that this the theory that we actually obtain is actually alive that you can actually see it Cool. Um, do you have some more follow-up question on that, Sir Al, or I, we can proceed to another uh, person? Yeah, uh, probably just a comment. Uh, okay, sure. Yung, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really working on that uh, area, oh. but uh, I uh, attended uh, a workshop before where uh, they also did this uh, denoising. But, uh, but the, the, the problem there is you already know the original picture. You just put noise on it and then try to uh, cover it. So, uh, uh, they have a specific example where in um, you don't really know uh, the image itself, like it's a problem on atherosclerosis or something. And then um, they have several images uh, that, that could happen. And then they, they use machine learning techniques, which I, I don't mm. know uh, about it. And then they try to, uh, to, um, to uh, compute uh, and to produce what could be the main uh, profile of uh, of that uh, specific uh, atherosclerosis, uh, so something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I see. 
Yeah, I think on the, on I think on the problem the ones in doing uh, machine learning, um, you, they they usually just like apply some regularization scheme, uh, some like you know like take on of and then just hope that they get some image. Actually, some of them probably should have like, probably uh, I I think I'm not sure if they actually actually apply some schemes on fine tuning the regularization parameter, which we will in theory, in theory is very in theoretical point of view is very important. So. That's why in machine learning we want to like generalize the theory so that even the problems on machine learning we can actually that can be captured by the theory because on actual problems you have fewer and fewer assumptions uh, and more relaxed assumptions and not all those assumptions can be uh, verified so it's also nice to like look on those more actual problems and see how the method works. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Okay, I think Sir Ren has a has another question. No po. So yes, um, so lang po ako da, add dun sa kayo, Sir Ao. Um, so I assume na uh, finite element yung ginamit mo sa pag-solve ng, PD, ng PDE, no? Kasi uh, yes. Kasi may formulation, eh, no? Uh, yes, yes, finite element, yeah. Okay. Um, kasi ay, pwede mong i-check yung free fem. Hindi ko lang kung alam mo yun. Yeah, yeah, I actually use free fem. In the... okay. So actually sa free fem, say. pwede, madali yeah. lang naman iset yung, ano, eh, yeah. yung, yung boundary, di ba? Hindi naman siya kailangan, um, a square. Yeah. Kasi yeah, exactly. yung maganda sa free fem ay plug in mo lang version formulation. Kasi kailangan mo lang ay yung parameterization ng ng boundary. So yung sinasabi, yung dagdag ko lang sa comment ni Sir Ao, kasi naging problem din namin siya ay what if you have um sort of a CT scan of a body, no? So yung itsura niya, hindi siya square, hindi siya circle. Medyo uh -huh. ano siya, uh, bilog siya, pero parang uh -huh. thorax. Bilog uh -huh. siya, pero irregular yung shape. Pero sa, ah, sa free frame kasi, ang kailangan mong ilagay ay yung uh, arc length parameterization ng curve. Kasi pag, pag circle lang siya, di ba madali lang siya ilagay pag mm -hmm. ellipse. Pero kapag um, yung parameterization mo, ay yung curve mo ay close tapos ay not necessarily circle or ellipse, pwede kang gumamit uh, ng um, Fourier series. Parang i-approximate mo, uh, yung, i mo yung curve gamit ang uh, Fourier. Tapos kahit uh, meron any arbitrary um, boundary, uh, na smooth. Pwede naman may mga rough edges lalo mag-iaan mo lang siya eh. Proximate mo lang siya mm -hmm. by smooth. Uh, uh, yun. Oh, okay. Tapos, uh, pwede mo siyang i-explore. Dagdag ko lang din sa comment ni Sir Ao. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. Pwede yung dagdag na tanong or ano. Uh, Parang may hindi lang ako nahabol eh. Okay lang. Go ka. ahead, sir. Okay. Siguro, um, hindi ko lang alam kung paano na-define yung noise level kanina kasi oh. parang yung noise level delta, paano siya nakadefine? Yun ang hindi ko naabot. Just ah. so, to give more context dun sa maiging next question ko. Sorry. Late ako ah. eh. Then that's okay. Kapatulog. <laughs> then that's okay. Um, yeah, ano yung noise level mo? Ano yung, sabi, ano yung definition lang niya? So to speak. Uh, okay, noise, or, ano? noise level is simply the, like, the difference between the noisy data and the exact data compute by the, let's say, the ah, okay, okay, okay. Or Kasi, the okay. okay, 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 okay. Ah, okay. Malino na. Kasi, and this is where my comment will now come in. Kasi, what, uh, as I remember, you were talking about mga Gaussian noise or non Gaussian. Meron kasi two aspects of how we statisticians would deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. One aspect is, okay, we have a non Gaussian noise. Maybe we can transform it into Gaussian, <gasps> which will be the next path would be uh, the trans, ano? Uh, either variance stabilizing transformation or linearizing transformation. Para even though my problem has non-Gaussian noise, sige, gawa akong paraan para maging Gaussian. Para pwede mo pa rin gawin yung mga gusto kong gawin. Uh, Gagawin ka mukhang Gaussian, which is common for forecasting, for time series, uh, also with certain regression modeling na parang i-transform ko muna yung data para magbuka siyang linear para madali na lang ang buhay ko. May isa namang uh, aspect na, okay, we will totally focus on the specific form of the uh, Gaussian noise, uh, the non-Gaussian noise, which is either in certain financial activities, we exactly fit with respect to the structure that the noise we assume, which is again another assumption. Or mm -hmm. the growing field would be non-parametrics, in which you just let the noise be itself and you have to use certain alternative schemes. Pero parang nasasagot naman siya, for example, if you use an L1 norm, 
-hmm. which is going to reduce to a median estimate. If you use an L1 norm in your data misfit function, in your data misfit functional, oh. mm -hmm. ang sagot doon is median. If you use okay. some other form of functional, which is, for example, the mean absolute percentage error, may ibang ano yon aspect. So, may mga ganung tracks within statistics that we are doing. So, parang pag... So, gusto ko lang malaman if ever... Uh, if ever mm. na-absorb yun in your context or uh, I do not know how that could be applied to the problem uh, that you have right now. I see. Yeah, sure. Um, In my... In in my study, because in the regularization theory, we just assume that you have a noise level delta. And because we want to generalize the theory, we don't care where, where the heck that noise came from. We just assume that it's there already. And then we just prove the theory. But we prove that this noise level, if you if the noise level decays to zero, then your noisy data should um, get close to the um, exact data. So in, in the theory that we work on, uh, we don't actually, um, cons uh, we just assume that the, the noise, but when it comes to where the noisy data is, that's where the type of space that you should work on uh, matters. If you use a, a very, um, uh, a not so smooth space, let's say a Banach space, then you, um, in the theory using uh, on balance spaces, you can capture those uh, more uh, non-smooth um, solution. And of course, you in order to um, you know capture those um, data with some non-Gaussian noise, what we do in our part is simply to apply the, to relax some assumptions like the smoothness of the space so that the theory can accommodate them. Okay. Um, does that satisfy you, Peter? Um, let's just see how things would look in that. Because, parang again, um, yeah. it is a lot of yeah. tracks. There are different mindsets between different statisticians. So, mm -hmm. if you're gonna ask me what about my mindset uh, as a forecaster. Um, my excuse would be just use a linearizing transformation, correct for the bias mm -hmm. adjustment, and then uh, also that's all gonna be handled by forecasting. Diri kasi uh, maganda masyado if you are overfitting the data. Yeah. Uh, because once you overfit, medyo mababaliw ka na pagdating mo sa forecasting. So there yeah. are just, and in typical practice, we also review certain results din naman in terms of does it really make sense so, siguro, um, uh, though the research is wonderful, especially once we get to more and more complex data, kasi in the end, I, that's where I would see it naman eh, in this ano, idea. The more that you generalize the data yeah. space, the, the data space in which you mm -hmm. uh, accommodating as many as more complex data as you can, uh, this is necessary. Mm -hmm. Siguro lang I have my statistician sensibilities telling me na <laughs> um, uh, there should be certain care and concern with respect to mm -hmm. uh, problems that can make things worse, especially in, this, in the realm of the estimation of unknown quantities of the parameters that are going to describe the structure. Kasi mm -hmm. big problem din talaga yung overfitting for one. Mm, I see. I see what you're saying, Peter. But anyway, uh, I think we can proceed to another uh, question. Uh, Alexis, you raised your hand. Yes, if you would indulge me. Well, first of all, so, um, hi, Romel. How are you? Hi, Islam. Musta? Good. <laughs> Very good. wonderful. So let Thanks. me see. <clears throat> I... Um, First of all, thank you very much for that wonderful lecture and uh, uh, for highlighting your research and for all the achievements you've done so far. I commend it. Okay, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. I can see that you there's a lot of theory involved and in particular, you were able to generalize some sort of the known theoretical framework. 
But along the way, you mentioned something about assuming a priori estimates. Now, if my if I get the context clearly, when you say a priori estimates, that means estimates that are known or perhaps assumed. Now, I would like to ask if either one they could be obtained, two or they, could they be informed from real life uh, real life scenarios or is it just a matter of technical as uh, is it just a technical piece to the general framework that you're doing in other words parang inassume na lang and maybe later on you could try to figure out whether this could be uh, this could be realized in a practical sense oh sure so in the, uh, i think one of the prior estimates that we need in some of the theory that we get is so for instance the noise uh for instance, the noise level, yeah, you can have a prior, I think in some applications you can, you, you may not have a prior estimate on the noise level because, and that's what we want to accommodate on the, uh, on the, on the regularization theory. First, we assume that you have a noise level, a constant that you can actually compute, but in our research, we want to remove any assumption that you can use the noise level in, let's say, fine tuning the regularization uh, the regularization parameter. And I think another prior thing that you can act that also uh, we that is also like a key ingredient in our theory is the, any prior information on the sort solution that you actually get. Actually, if you if you mention that, um, I only consider like two um, th types of penalty functionals. One is like the L1 and the TV uh, total variation. It's because in most applications, you there's actually the ones that are more um, uh, that are mo more common. If there are other sorts of penalty functionals that we can use, um, we do not know yet. But not only a theory does is if you have these assumptions on the penalty functional which we want to be really like relaxed, then we can actually use this. Um, we can actually accommodate more types of penalty uh, functionals. And that's also like what we actually want to consider because in the theory, like where, where we want to show, like see if there are like other sorts of penalty functionals out there. In fact, in some applications, you don't, they don't really have a penalty functional, like they do something else, which, I see. Yeah, somehow, okay. Do you think that the problem regarding assuming a priori estimates could be a, 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 another kind of direction for you, or maybe this could be something on a secondary? Yes, um, that's actually what we normally do in um, regularization. Uh, in what in my research, like we what yeah we want to like uh, obtain um, convergence results with the most relaxed assumptions possible and with uh -huh. The fewer, the fewer prior information possible that we I have. See. That's why we generalize the theory. We just have a piece of functional and then assume that this is this is it, this is that, and then. Okay, I think there's the key point there. The one good yeah. thing about generalizing is the theory is that you could yeah. try to avoid as many assumptions as possible, exactly. thereby applying your framework to as many cases as possible. Is, mm -hmm. um, are, are we on the same wavelength on this? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Okay. Pardon? No, no. What I meant to say is this is just a comment, but when you try okay. to generalize things, you're trying to avoid as many assumptions as possible. Uh, in so doing, you could yeah. apply your uh, framework to as many real-life problems as possible. Is this, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. Yes, um, that's, that's, that's actually two things. First, you try to generate to try to use assumptions as relaxed as possible that's how, that, that, that's how we call it like there are assumptions that are not so strong and like in, in, in theoretical like they're not so strong and they want to make them as weak as possible while using less prior information uh, possible and in some way it depends on actual but considering the any prior information not on the solution but on the problem you're working on itself Okay, great. So I think that's uh, that's all on my part. Um, okay. Keep up the good work. Congratulations, okay. and most importantly, please stay safe. I think this oh, is like oh, a sure. buzzword right now. This is like oh, yeah. a buzzword right now in COVID nineteen.
Oh yeah, it's a uh, everything is all the plans are broken now because of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have you okay. Another question? Um, yep. Last last question um, from YouTube. So yeah. we have uh, uh, attendees sa YouTube. Uh, uh, before ko basahin yung um, uh, question, may isang sinabi muna dito na comment. Yung question ni Sir Peter may ginagamit sa data science na cross validation. For example, sa pag-tune ng regularized parameter, we perform cross-validation oh. or bootstrap. Yun yung sabi niya. And then, ah. may question siya. Um, sabi, hindi daw siya expert on inverse problems, but uh, he's, or, hindi ko lang alam kung he or she, uh, interested siya sa variational approach. Uh, mm -hmm. Yung variational approach, di ba approximation din siya? Question mark. Ano yung ginagamit mm -hmm. algorithm to solve it? How good is the approximation? So, that's the question. Oh. Hey, right, so let's start in the in the yeah in that variational yeah so that the idea behind the variational form is you have an original problem that is ill post if you solve that ill post problem you will not get a good solution so what you do is to establish the problem and that's where the regular variational regularization comes in and how to solve that regularization uh, uh the variation that kind of problem um in a theoretical aspect, um, for us, it doesn't matter. As long as you can have an efficient numerical scheme to solve it, then, then we're good. And that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Romel. And uh, to close the, this uh, webinar, um, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Kayen Arceo. Sabi niya, ano, mag-open na daw siya ng camera. Yay. Hi. <laughs> Hey, I'm and I, I'd hate to break tradition. Sabi ni Mayang uh, tradition Hi, daw to open after the ano eh. So it's just uh, na natatawa lang ako kasi I will open my camera to close the webinar. Hi, Ma. Everyone. Well, okay, okay. It's always so uh, a treat to see you all. Romel, thank you very much. That was uh, very informative, uh, very comprehensive, very interesting. You judge as well from the very animated discussion and the many questions that you got. Huh? With respect to this webinar series, the, the pandemic actually gave us a problem, eh, diba? They were problem solvers naman. The problem was parang how can we meet? How can we continue meeting? How can we continue studying? How can we continue sharing our research? And well, this inter-campus initiative solved the problem, no? So the, we are problem solvers at work. So we found a solution to that problem, no? Coming together, I can see on the screen representatives of uh, Los Baños, Mindanao, Visayas, Diliman. We're continuing meeting. We're continuing the sharing of research. So, ang galing. Uh, it's a nice achievement for the webinar series. And on FB, thank you to those who are also listening through, through FB and our other platforms. Please continue doing so. We would like to uh, encourage everyone to maximize on this opportunity um let's keep meeting let's keep uh sharing our research and the silver lining actually is we usually get to see each other parang pag msp no <laughs> and maybe one or two other conferences like iwomb and such or unless we visit our campuses so it's a big jump from seeing each other once twice a year to now actually seeing each other weekly so it's a very good uh, development. We continue sharing and we are bound to learn something new from every, every webinar we attend. And it's very exciting. So uh, we hope we will uh, keep staying in touch through this webinar. We've had a very wide range of topics. Na kailan na ba tayo? Anim? Anim na ba? We've had two Pika, from each. Yata. Oh, oh, parang dalawa oh. na from each campus, no? Oh. Um, more, more, more pa. And more campuses sana. And a wide variety of applications that we are seeing in as much as this is an applied math webinar series and potential applications yet to come. So thank you, everyone. Please uh, keep staying tuned. We watch out every week for Jomar's announcement. And uh, back to Jomar, ano ang susunod? Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you, Ma'am Kayen. Thank you. Um, uh, next, Kayen. Yes, next week we have uh, another um, webinar, although we finalized pa yung details. We will uh, post sa Facebook. So uh, for now, 11.30, pwede na tayong magluto ng lunch. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you dun sa mga people na nasa YouTube and uh, Facebook. Okay, yeah. thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so Bye-bye. much. Bye-bye. Ingat safe. kayong lahat. God bless. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you po. Be safe, Bye. everyone. Be safe. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.